Hey guys, Dr. Isertel of Renaissance Periodization here, and I have the glorious fortune, perhaps misfortune, of interviewing Juggernauts, the Juggernaut, Chad Wesley Smith. Chad, thanks for having me over. Thanks for coming. Over, Excellent. Dr. Mike. Excellent. We have this little circuit box here as a little background decoration. A couple of questions for Chad. Uh, it's interesting, uh, kind of an enigma. You're really big in promoting other people on social media and other lifters uh, with, uh, associated with your website and brand. A lot of people don't really know a lot about Chad. It's kind of comical when you total, what did you total at your last meet in Australia? Uh, 2314. 2314, which is uh, top number eight all time. I, I believe so, yeah. Uh, eight all time raw total ever. And uh, a lot of people at the meet and then later on the internet were like, hey man, I, I had no idea you were that strong. So a lot of people don't really know much about Chad, and we're here to kind of sort this out for the first time. So we got a couple questions for you, if that's okay. Sounds good. All right. So the first one, uh, give us your basic stats as a lifter. What do you squat, bench, deadlift, and upright row for reps? Uh, yeah, so my best competition squat is 959 pounds, 435 kilos. Bench is uh, 551, 250 kilos. And deadlift is 804, 365 kilos. For a 23.14 total, which was set uh, GPA Worlds in Sydney, Australia, November 2014. Uh, upright row, maybe like 95 for 5 or something. That's kilos, right? Yeah. Excellent. All right. That's actually one of the power lifts. You guys didn't know that. Okay. Let's backtrack. Early life. I imagine you were born about 280 pounds. Yeah. Um, tell us about your early life, uh, particularly your involvement with sport as a youth, before you picked up your first barbell or dumbbell. Right. Uh, well, I was 10 pounds, 3 ounces at, at birth. And Is that big for a baby? I don't know. Minimum of, of that was 90% head. Like, of course. That's, that's actually what I lend my trap development to. It was survival. Uh, otherwise, I'd just been like elephant man, just tipping over. Yeah. So I had to adapt. Gigantic Literally head. adapt or die. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, growing up I played all kinds of sports, uh, really with the main focus being on soccer, basketball, and track and field uh, before I got into into high school and started lifting weights and stuff. Um, and, but I've always been very interested in, in training, uh, and I think a lot of it goes back to me watching like too many, you know, Rocky montages and uh, clips from the Little Giants as well. Yeah, you know, um, all the training that they're doing leading up to the game is even the first time that I played football. I think I was nine years old, and, uh, and you know my mom could attest to this that I was in the in the backyard like bungee cording myself to trees and like sprinting against the bungee cord in, in the backyard to get myself ready for for pee wee football traps. So that's something that's just always really really interested me. But uh, I think my my background in track and field uh, was extremely important to, to everything that came after it. So I started doing track when I was eight years old um, and began as a sprinter and throwing the shot put. Um, and you know, we just we did tons of running, obviously, running drills, jumps, throws, different bounding, you know, tons of calisthenics. And I think it, it really built up uh, both general movement patterns and uh, general work capacity that uh, you know, set a very good foundation for me. Um, okay, and how, so when you got into high school, when was your first association with lifting of any kind, and how big were you by that time? What did you weigh? Um, you know, a, a couple of very, very few workouts before high school, like not even worth mentioning, but, but really it would have been the summer going into my freshman year of high school. So I had just turned 14 years old. Um, I was about five foot eight, five foot seven, maybe, uh, 170, 175 pounds. Um, That's pretty big, yeah. right, for that age? Uh, I, I have a lot of friends who, at the same age, were much, much bigger, um, especially guys who ended up being comparably sized to what I am now. Um, but I, I was always just kind of a short, stocky kid growing up, but very like fast and agile for my build. Um, okay. But yeah, the, I remember the first time lifting, uh, the first time we tested a bench press max, which was like the only test that we did. Like I benched 155 pounds. Big man. Yeah. I benched 55 for a couple of reps when I started at <laughs> about the same age. So, all right, so high school. Take us through um, your basic, so you were involved I believe, in football and track and field in high yeah. school. Take us through kind of your year of training and also what did you eat? Because my nutrition personally in high school was just atrocious. 
I didn't catch that bandwagon until much later. Uh, from what I understand, you managed to put on quite a bit of weight through high school. Take us th kind of through that general story there. Yeah, so like I said, about 175 pounds, five foot eight, um, when I started high school. But yeah, I, I was maybe just on like the cusp of puberty at that point. So I was, I was a boy. And when I graduated high school, I was about six foot, maybe a little bit more than six feet tall, uh, 275 pounds. So you know, I get four inches and 100 pounds growth. Um, and you know, I went from being like a, a good average football player and a better than average, maybe good shot putter, um, and really just kind of worked and worked and worked my way to becoming you know, pretty elite in, in both of those. Uh, being in, like an all county, all Orange County, a very densely populated football rich area player in football and uh, an all American in track and field in the shot put. And that, that was just because I, I realized that I, I was good at lifting, so everyone likes doing what they're good at. Um, and just, you know, th like two, three, four hours a day, four, five, six days a week for those four years in a row. And that was all d designing my own programs um, from stuff I would find on the internet. And yeah, this is 2002, 2003, 2004, much less information available than there is now. Um, but I was lucky that I, I did so much stuff that a lot of it, you know, when, when you are just having a shotgun approach to it, a lot of it, you know, or some of it's going to be good. And, and luckily for me, a lot of it uh, was good. And I think it was because the things I was good at, you know, uh, squats and like sprinting and jumping and, and power cleans, those are the things I wanted to do because that's what I was good at. So, and those are all, you know, pretty good things to. So, luckily, you weren't good at curls or anything like yeah. that. Is, you know, I'm, I'm right. still, I'm still very bad at curls. But yeah, I just kind of grew from that. What I had mentioned, you know, 5'8", 175 pounds, benched 155. And I think I, as a freshman in high school, I threw the 10 pound shot put about 46 feet, which would probably be about 42 feet with the 12 pound shot put. To as a senior, was benching, still wasn't a great bencher by any stretch of the imagination, maybe benching 340, 350, uh, squatting low 500s, you know, 525, 550, probably a little bit above parallel. Uh, but then through the shot put, the 12 pound, uh, you know, regular high school shot put. 62 feet six inches somewhere in that range one uh, our section for Southern California which is about 600 schools uh, won that two years in a row um, and uh, I'm probably more proud of like my running and jumping it's like a 4 8 40 and could dunk a basketball you know, when I had 270 pounds it's pretty impressive uh, and you're not that tall how tall are you uh, now I'm about six one. Then I was probably five eleven and a half or six foot. Not bad, not bad at all. So, I you went straight to the NBA <laughs> after. Okay, so you went to, to college to throw the shot primarily. Yeah. Tell us about your college career, some of the ups and downs. Yeah. So uh, you know, went in as part of a very highly touted recruiting class to the University of California Berkeley. We we're actually the number one recruiting class in the country, uh, but I was kind of a lesser part of that. Um, but you know, went in with very high expectations to throw very far there. Redshirted my first year, and then things just, you know, they, they weren't what uh, we expected them to be. We weren't progressing the, the way that I had hoped. Uh, so at that point I decided, actually, I had stopped doing track and field about halfway through my sophomore year. And then at the end of my sophomore year, transferred to a junior college back here in Southern California. Started coaching football, uh, running the off-season program for the football team coaching the shot put, but not really training myself at all. Coaching high school? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, training very haphazardly for a period of almost 20 months. You know, I trained hard for a couple of weeks, then, you know, lightly or not at all for a few weeks, and just very, you know, up and down, and, and didn't have any uh, expectation of continuing my own athletic career at, uh, you know, the ripe age of 19. <laughs> and uh, But, you know, I got talked into when I, when I transferred to a, a very small school, Concordia University in Irvine, got talked into coming back to throw because the throws coach there is the same guy who had coached me in high school, Len Blutrick, who had had a, you know, a great impact on my, on my career. And uh, you know, with that, he talked me in coming back to throw. I hadn't touched a shot put in about 20 months, as I'd mentioned, and ended up that year, my redshirt junior year, so my fourth year in college, only throwing 53 feet now with a 16 pound shot put where I had thrown about 55 feet as a true freshman. So this was you know, very discouraging to me. I was kind of injured a lot that year just from a, you know, sort of a lack of fitness and, and very frustrated about it. 
Um, but then the next year decided to come back. So you stuck with it? Yeah. Uh, I pretty much had to, had to stick with it because of uh, financial stuff where they were giving us some, gonna give me some uh, scholarship. So I decided if I was gonna do it, I was gonna come back and I was gonna do it right. You know, I couldn't stand to be so, you know, even though it was, I was probably average, but it, for me it was terrible. Like I, I was throwing terribly. So I decided to come back and really do everything I could to excel there. And uh, that senior year, Richard senior year, I was able to throw 63 feet 10 inches, uh, which was the number three throw in the country for collegiate athletes that year. So a bit pretty big turnaround from uh, what seemed like it was going to be a, a very bad college career. Very cool. All right, Chad. So continuing on with our discussion of what it is that makes a juggernaut, or rather the juggernaut. We know it's actually a magical helmet from Korea that made yeah. the juggernaut. Yes. So, helmet, gemstone, right? Gemstone. Yeah. You have no idea. Yeah. Not, you don't know anything about pop culture, do you? Not, not nerd culture, say. Gemstone. <laughs> it's a great episode of X Men, by the way. So, you have finished a, rel a quite very successful collegiate throwing career. Uh, where does powerlifting come into the mix? When did you start lifting? Oh, I'm sorry, you've been lifting this whole time. Yeah. What got you into competitive powerlifting? Yeah, so I, I continued with the shot put one year uh, as a post-collegiate, but unfortunately the coach I had mentioned, uh, Len Blutrick, he, uh, he passed away shortly after I graduated college. So that left me, uh, one without a coach, you know, just kind of wavering in my, in my motivation, uh, you know, where for a bit I'd maybe been a sort of dark horse candidate to, to be a 2012 Olympian, perhaps. Um, but I had also started Juggernaut at the time, right right out of uh, college. And in the, I graduated in May 2009, began writing a business plan for Juggernaut in June 2009, and uh, we opened for business in September 2009, but we'll talk more about that. Um, so, you know, without a coach, I, I continued to try and throw, but the U.S. is so competitive in the shot put that, uh, you know, doing it, very part-time while I was working very full-time um, and doing it without a coach just kind of made it impossible to do it at the level that I truly wanted to do it, you know, as trying to push to be on the Olympic team. Uh, so I figured, well, I'm already strong, um, so let's see what this whole powerlifting thing was about. Uh, I think coming out of track, say, in just a belt, was squatting 650-ish, bench, but like a ballistic style bench, bench press, so, you know, bounce, uh, like 485, 500. Uh, never trained the deadlift at all. I had stopped doing the Olympic lifts earlier in my college career. Um, so during college, if I might interrupt you, you put on a ton on your bench press during college. Yeah. So you think that has something to do with your throwing improvement? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think particularly within those ranges, you know, going from 350 to 500, of course, that's going to help you improve. You know, as I looked to pushing beyond 500, I think that's when you really get the point of diminishing returns. Specializing into bench pressing. Yeah. Uh, I've met a lot of throwers that uh, were benching in the mid to low threes, and they didn't see a reason to bench any higher than that. Do you have any messages for that? Shot putters particularly? Yeah, I mean, if, if we were just to play the law of averages here and look at all the world's best shot putters, how many of them aren't benching 500 pounds? Some of those guys incline 500 pounds. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, you'll you'll find that the answer is you know zero or maybe one or two of them. So yeah, if you think that you're one of those one or two in the entire world, go for it. Chances are you're probably not, and you'll be better served to to raise that within the context of like the entire training program, not trying to be a bench press specialist. Of course. Of course. Um, and I think also had some very impressive like speed power numbers at that time as about now about 290 pounds and uh, on the laser timing I ran a, a 463 40 yard dash and had a 35 and a half inch vertical and did a 50 inch standing box or seated box jump um, so that's that doesn't really make any sense you know that right like that's crazy yeah. wow yeah. all right so <laughs> and now I do the with the lifting and the jumping and it ain't works so okay you get into powerlifting. What did you think of your first meet? Did you like the competition? Some people do their first meet and they're like, eh. What did you think? Yeah, you know, the the first meet was an interesting experience because I was used to doing you know, track, which even though it's not the most popular sport in, in the U.S., are still in these big stadiums and I've competed in front of thousands of people. Just like powerlifting. <laughs> yeah. 
So I go to my first powerlifting meet at uh, in the gymnasium at Cal Poly or uh, San Luis Obispo High School, um, and you know there's maybe 75 people watching and it's kind of poorly lit and stuff, but it was fun. Um, yeah, you know, I, I just I'm a competitor my entire my entire life. Whether it was you know we were playing cards or or you know hopscotch and we were like six years old or whatever through every sport I've, I've done and, and now in lifting and business I'm just a very competitive person so I enjoyed that element of things um, you know it gave me something to still focus my training on uh, after after track was was uh, gone. And so that was really helpful to me. Um, you don't really like to just train, huh? No, it, it makes no sense to me. You need a goal. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. The, uh, so yeah, that first powerlifting meet, I used the juggernaut method. Uh, you know, that's what I really created it for was my own training. Uh, we were using it with a lot of our athletes at the gym, um, but I used verbatim the way it's written in the in the first book to train for it, and uh, ended up. Lifting as a 308, uh, weighed about 300 pounds, squatted 800 in belt and knee wraps, benched 462, and uh, deadlifted 700. Very cool. Very cool. Fast forwarding through the sport, what are your proudest powerlifting accomplishments? Uh, I mean, without a doubt, I think all, all three of them happened uh, this past November in Australia. With When I was your handler, yeah. Brantley Thornton helped too. <laughs> he did. More yes. than I did. <laughs> And Ed Cohen helped as well. Thanks, Bradley and Ed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, you know, go, going to tra travel into this meet in Australia, competing on, you know, one of the biggest stages that, that the sport has seen against guys who are really, you know, top all-time lifters, and and having the best performance of my life there. Yeah, uh, it's going to be hard to beat that as as the best best accomplishment. Yeah, very impressive. What is a uh, juggernaut? When did you create Juggernaut, or did you simply inherit it from a wealthy relative? <laughs> uh, no, yeah, Juggernaut is is really that's that's my baby. Uh, like, I, like I mentioned earlier, I said in uh, in 2009 I graduated college with a degree in history mm -hmm. uh, because I had at one point intended to continue coaching high school football, which I did for three years, and then become a teacher and a head coach. And then I realized I'm, I'm would make a terrible employee to to any city or, or school district. Um, so I decided that I had to be my own boss and uh, uh, graduated in May 2009. As I mentioned, began, wrote the business plan in, in June 2009, at least what I thought was a business plan at the time. It wasn't. Um, <laughs> I was later informed that that was not a business yeah. plan. <laughs> or barely even a plan. Um, and then, you know, along with uh, Nate, Nate Winkler, opened Juggernaut, a physical gym location in September 2009. And really just hustled, you know, to find athletes to train. Like we started with zero clients in September 2009, and you know, since then I've trained you know, NFL football players, you know, UFC fighters, jiu-jitsu world champions, you know, big-time Division One college football players, basketball players, all kinds of stuff. Um, and you know, that was really just built on on tireless work ethic. When did the website really take off? Yeah, so you know, the, the whole time we had been writing articles here and there, and of course had a website, um, and did you know the first Juggernaut Method book in was released in late 2010. Yeah, late 2010, uh, a couple months after that first powerlifting meet. Uh, but it was really in kind of late 2012 that I decided to, to make a real push towards you know sharing information and, and the way that we train and our thoughts about training with a, with a broader audience. Um, so I started to seek out other experts in their specific fields uh, to help me do that. And you know, Brandon Lilly was, was really one of the first guys that came about in that. And he and I, and it was a very chance situation because he and I had only met one time. Um, we'd been at a couple of meets together. Um, the first time that we met, he actually thought that I was a firefighter uh, because I had a really cool mustache. Um, it was, really, Brandon? It, it that's it, 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 that's it, all it takes? It inspired firefighting to him. Uh, I think he thought I was one of those firefighters that in like the sexy calendars where I like hold the axe over my back and stuff Why does like he that. know about that? Huh? I don't know. Why do you know about that? I, I watch like Access Hollywood and E and stuff, you know. Let, let's move on <laughs> okay. to another. Okay, so you met him. Yeah, so, but you know, we hadn't even talked. I think he was too intimidated by my regularly handsome firefighter good looks. To, to, to talk to me. So we'd only met one time at another event 
and just sort of decided like, oh yeah, you do powerlifting too. Do you want to write on the website? And that obviously has turned into a to a great you know friendship and and business relationship since then. And then just you know, I I know that I don't know everything about training, and, and there's a lot of you know fields that I'm nowhere near an expert in. So I just decided to seek those people out and uh, have been able to to do that and very successfully and bring together you know, experts from all these different domains and provide a platform for them to really share share their knowledge with a, with a pretty broad audience. Very cool. What's uh, the proudest accomplishment of Juggernaut so far? Oh, yeah, you know, th there's not like a single moment that I could say, but uh, you know, any time that we're at an event, you know, whether it's something like GPA Worlds or the Arnold or anything like that, and guys who are really, really top in their field come up and, and say, you know, I remember when Ed Cohen came up and said, hey, I read your website, it's really great. Like when the greatest powerlifter of all time, you know, acknowledges what you're doing and, and people, you know, who are top of their field across different sports and stuff uh, will express that to me. You know, that, that's always something I'm very, very proud of. Very awesome. Uh, future directions for Juggernaut. What can we expect from the website? Um, yeah, hopefully more of the same, just doing, continuing to do a better job of that. Bringing these, these high level coaches and athletes and providing them a place and, and giving them the guidance on how to best share their expertise with, uh, with a broader, uh, a broader group of people. Um, you know, just continuing to do that in a more effective, more entertaining, you know, better produced manner. Hey Chad, all right, so Juggernaut's been really successful. Uh, future directions for the website and for the business, what can we expect? Uh, so as far as the website goes, I mean, we have a redesign, a total redesign of the website coming in early 2015, which I think is going to be great and, and really set us apart from any other fitness website in how uh, you know, effectively we can present this information uh, to people and you know, lead them from, from one valuable article into you know, a related valuable piece and just, you know, that, that's my, my main goal is to most effectively share knowledge with coaches and athletes out there to help them reach their goals. So, you know, just better streamlining that process on the website, um, you know, bringing together more coaches and athletes, you know, just continuing to broaden our reach as far as, you know, bringing in more high level people across all these fields and uh, you know, giving them the guidance and, and the platform to share that knowledge. Um, you know, growing, uh, <clears throat> growing our events because I think that's one of the best ways that we're really able to, to teach people. So you know, specialty clinics for powerlifting. Want to get our weightlifters out there doing more stuff. Uh, our mobility movement guys, Dr. Quinn and, and Ryan Brown, doing that. You know, just being able to get more hands-on coaching with people. Uh, this last year we were very fortunate to be able to travel to Ireland, Scotland, England, and Australia to do that. So we're looking forward to you know continuing to do events all across the U.S. and, and across the world. Um, you know we're going to have a new Juggernaut facility opening in Southern California in early 2015. So being able to you know get hands-on coaching with uh, athletes, powerlifters, weightlifters, you know, competitive CrossFit athletes under one roof. And, and just having that, you know, a real home for Juggernaut to, to host events and, and to do all that stuff. And, you know, more than anything, just to continue to support these athletes and coaches and, and show them how to build their own brand and, and you know, provide uh, a livelihood for themselves doing what they're truly passionate about. Very cool. Very cool. We'll look forward to that stuff. A couple of questions, sort of to close this out, uh, about the, the man, the human <laughs> That is Chad Wesley Smith. I think a lot of viewers will agree with me. Most people think you're a robot, but you are actually a human being, correct? As far as I know. Okay, your programming at least says that you're supposed to answer yeah. yes to that question. Fine. So, for so sometimes I rest if I cry. I see. Okay. Four, four distinct questions for you to the human side. Um, growing up in the gang culture uh, of Irvine, California. How did that affect you? And, uh, we're actually in Irvine now, right? And, um, you know, I, I'm afraid my car's going to get stolen right out of the lot. Uh, I have to wear the right kind of colors uh, because wearing the wrong colors in Irvine is a really bad idea. 
Did you were you ever bullied when you grew up? Did you join a gang? Did you start a gang? Is Juggernaut a gang? Uh, you know, Juggernaut may or may not. Is, I, I think it's more of like a secret society, mm. like a Freemasons, Illuminati sort right. of situation. But you know, in all reality, um, I did grew up in Orange County, California. It's like a wonderful, beautiful place. I sometimes wish that I had more stories of, of hardship to inspire uh, you know viewers with, and that's probably why I don't do a lot of stuff like this, but I got an amazing family who uh, actually adopted me when I was born, um, which is interesting. I, I met my birth mom and biological brothers last summer, and genetics are like a crazy thing because my birth mom is about five foot four, 130 pounds, and my biological brothers were only two and four years younger than I am, but they're about six foot 190 and about 5'10", 165. Um, so, what the hell happened to you, man? I, I think I because, maybe because I was first born, I just took all the good stuff. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> Especially the head size. Yeah. Uh, well, my birth, birth mom did tell me that she uh, had like a very, very strict um, pregnancy diet with me that she did not follow with the other mm. ones. So that that could be part of it. But you know, I'd, I'd say my biological brothers did look at me in a way that said. I'm really glad I didn't grow up in the same house with you because I would have gotten so many like wedgies and noogies. But since I'm much younger than my bro brothers and my adopted family, I was the recipient of all of those. Really? And I think it probably, and this is think, true for anyone who's the youngest, it really does push your development and you know, watching them play sports and, and doing all that stuff was really helpful. My parents had always been extremely supportive of, uh, of everything that I've done. So thank you, mom and dad, for that. Very cool, if you're watching. Um, all right, your favorite movie. I don't want this top five nonsense. All right, my favorite. If I had to just pick one movie, you're stuck on a 25-hour flight to Dubai. You get one movie you can play on loop. Okay, one movie that I'll play on loop. Uh, the Departed. The Departed, you mean? Yes, it's got parts that make me laugh because of their ridiculous accents. It's just a great, a great story. The Departed's a great movie. It all ends well too. <laughs> Very. I saw an interview with with uh, Mark Wahlberg the other day, and they were talking about uh, Departed Two, in which Digman, uh, Donnie Wahlberg, plays the the main character. <laughs> but, Mark Wahlberg can do no wrong in my eyes. He's pretty good. He's pretty good. Your favorite song? My favorite song. You're in the gym. Big lift coming up. Uh -huh. Someone's like Chad. What are we playing? Well, for people who watch me lift weights on the internet, they know that I'm. Uh, I don't get really fired up. I'm, I'm not a very intense guy. I'm pretty, pretty laid back, relaxed. And uh, part of that is uh, a very conscious decision to not, you know, be like headbutting the bar and stuff as I get ready to go. I don't think it's a good part of the training process. Um, Do you think it adds too much fatigue in the short term? Definitely, okay. definitely. Um, so the music that I listen to is is not like tough guy metal and gangster rap. Sorry to disappoint. Um, if I just had to pick one song, like my favorite song, no matter what time You've of day. so far stalled for two minutes answering this question. I'm trying to think of a good answer. Katy Perry? Nah, and that's not a song. That's a that's a musician. It is to me. Shit all sounds the same. <laughs> okay. Um, so do you want the actual song or the artist? Well, let's take both. Okay. Um, so if if I my my favorite like lifting kind of pump up song when I do do that is also probably by my favorite musician, which is Mumford & Sons' uh, Dust Bowl Dance is my favorite favorite song, my favorite training song. Is there any way we can zoom in on his shoes? <laughs> is that possible? If you guys want to get a good feel for it, just follow me on Spotify, World's Strongest Hipster. It's a great playlist. Unbelievable. It is great. But Dust Bowl Dance, it throws everyone off because if you listen to it, it doesn't seem like a pump up song at all, but if you listen to the story that he's telling, he's talking about his like family being oppressed by like a corrupt local government and his dad dies and then he has to go out and like avenge for his family and he like kills the corrupt politicians and it has a real like arc to the story. It's a very good song. Oh, very cultured, very hipster, <laughs> very Orange County. Lastly, um, your favorite food? Well, I know that you were expressed your disappointment in in my eating in Australia. Yes, numerous times. Yeah, that you were you were hoping for more of a spectacle at, at every meal to fuel my my 350 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal. Your words, not mine. Verbatim. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
my, my favorite type of food is definitely Mexican. And breakfast, lunch, or dinner, you can't, you can't go wrong there. But if I was to build my perfect meal, and I know this isn't the question that you're asking, and I'm no, 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 no. answer Great. it that way just to frustrate you. Excellent. Yes. Would be um, Hawaiian, Hawaiian ribeye from a restaurant called Houston's, which is like a local restaurant. I actually think it might be a small chain. Um, I'm starting to believe they lied to me about the local part. <laughs> Houston. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah, Hawaiian so, ribeye. Yeah, Hawaiian ribeye from there, garlic mashed potatoes, and then my mom's mud pie for dessert, which she makes me on my birthday every year. You know, my mom never made me mud pie. That's because you're from the Soviet Union. It was actually mud actual, pie, but it was actual, actual mud. mud. Yes. Yes. It was technically mm -hmm. frozen uh, tundra. <laughs> so it was uh, permafrost <laughs> because uh, we don't have mud. Chad, thank you very much for taking time to talk with us uh, and exposing your uh, programmed human element. <laughs> um, your designers did very well with you and you're a very human-like machine. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys. See you next time.